Synthetic data in a talk I gave at CPOC in 2018. Okay? And I want to roll the tape. Unfortunately, the audio is not working, but it would have been a bold move, Cotton. Let's see how this works out for us. But unfortunately, um, I do have to say that CPOC, not unfortunately about CPOC. CPOS is awesome. Get your tickets. Uh, I'm going to promote it too because I love that conference. Uh, there's a lot. We had a team from Stroudsburg, a bunch of kids come out. Uh, back in 2019, the last time we did it live, we had 50 kids from East Stroudsburg University come out, somewhere around there. And it was just awesome to see them come out and absorb all the information. There was a lot of energy. There is a lot of fantastic talks. I actually go a, a lot of the time for unique talks that I wouldn't get anywhere else, like places that I things that I just wouldn't get from tutorial teaching. You know, Jake's tea. I don't know if he's doing tea again this year. Uh, but we should we should try to talk to him about it, because that's what the highlights do. It's a great way to get the community together, kind of like a community homecoming event. It's going to be nice to do it in person. So I hope to see you out there. But as far as uh, this, I did warn everybody about synthetic data. I will skip the talk, which I did record, okay? But I will skip it here about synthetic data in 2018 and where it was with what we know as GANs. And I mentioned at that time, there was a picture of Nicolas Cage as Jean-Luc Picard, okay? And how we can make these weird looking videos. It wasn't very good at the time, right? It's, and you could tell that it was fake. But now, oh Lord, I said, well, hold on, in three to five years from this talk, it's gonna be indistinguishable. And so, if I get past this now, we're going to have to be right here. So, um, let's talk about this, where synthetic data has gone to this point. Okay, so synthetic data used to be just images, but now, right, everybody knows about chat, GPT, everybody's you know, familiar with that. There's an AI alternative that just came out recently called Bloom, which was uh, made in open source, and you can go check it out. It was made by a team out of Europe. Uh, and Bing AI, of course, which wants to, you know, burger everything more long. <laughs> okay, which is Dolly, Stable Diffusion, and 3D Generated, okay? Now, Stable Diffusion is getting sued for, like, $1.7 trillion or something by Shut Shutterstock. So we'll see how long these generators stay around. But that's where we are right now. Audio, we have some of these cool... Now... These things here are all synthetically generated data, which means a computer is generating some false thing and then running against another computer. Uh, that's generally what these GANs operate on, right? Now, ChatGPT as an LLM is a little bit different technology underneath, okay? And it's far beyond what we're gonna talk about here. But today, we're gonna focus on images specifically. I just wanna talk about one small section. So we're taking this whole world of synthetic data 
and bringing it down to this one little piece. And hopefully everyone here will be able to play with it now. A website called thispersondoesnotexist.com. You can go check it out. And they post a new picture of someone every day. These all look like real people to me. I mean, it's pretty close. It's kind of crazy good synthetic data is now. And I'm sure you've seen some of the videos like Morgan Freeman. Do you see that one on Instagram? Uh, this is not Morgan Freeman talking. I don't know if anybody else has seen that. But, uh, I mean, it's crazy, crazy good. So, instead, we're going to talk about 3D simulations. And this is where companies like Tesla and OpenAI are kind of moving right now. And they're moving the, making digital twins of the world into simulation so they could do training data. And therefore, instead of having to, you know, pay for a truck to drive around, pay for cars to drive around, they can create a simulation and get a million very, very quickly. And that's what the name of the game is. How can we get a lot of data? And so what's going to happen is these 3D simulations augment the training, and then they're going to replace live data probably pretty soon. We're not quite there yet. Yeah, they still augment training. So what does that mean? So I can give you some examples. So for instance, this right here is what I was talking about with the 3D simulation. So that is uh, that's what Tesla and a lot of the Waze and all those other kind of companies, not Waze, um, Waymo, uh, and all those other kind of self-driving car companies are doing. Now here's uh, Unity, uh, Unreal, and a couple of other companies are also doing robotic simulation. Uh, and then you have uh, people, right? So we're going to talk about oh. you know, you're training your Roomba and like all these other robots that are running around your house. They're going to create these 3D simulations. Facebook is one of the first for whatever reason. I'm not sure why Facebook wants a simulation. Oh, a little weird. Our retail products. Now, these are just some of the ways that we have is. Now, this is what is known as. I'm not sure how to get that little thing off, off the side there. But uh, Unity Perception. And so I'm going to give you the basic idea of how this synthetic generation works. So you have a randomized background in a lot of ways for the people. I'm focusing on people. Just forget the self-driving cars and all that other stuff. Okay? You have a random background, and then you have the person, and then we add things to that over top of the foreground. Right? See how that's done? Now look how easy it is to get that image because it's in the 3D segmented, right? To pull it out from the background, to put a bound. To put key points on because they're already labeled in the in the avatar because it's created, right? I mean, that's how easy it is. And then you get all these weird, weird backgrounds. And you would think that that would hurt it, but actually it makes it better, it makes the system better at picking up images with these weird And it also helps with things like occlusion. Got a couch floating in the middle of the stairs. So that's a little bit about how these backgrounds and these images are made. Sample performance of these when you add these and what that means. Okay, so I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the AI term, so I won't dwell on it. But if you have precision recall, these are things that are often at odds with one another. So you have things known as a true positive and a false positive, right? So a true positive is the computer says, I got it, and this is correct. A false positive is the computer says, I got it, and they're wrong, right? So, and then you have false negatives and true negatives. And this precision and recall, this idea of you just take percentages of how often the computer is right in, for, in the negative versus the positive. Okay, They're, that's why they often work against each other. Now, I know this is a little tough to read at a distance for, for people, especially if you get older. Some of us, you know, can't see too far in the back there. Um, but this is the Coco training data set, which is still very popular for handling any kind of image segmentation. And then we have what's known as the people song people. That's one of the Unity libraries. We're not going to touch it today, but I'm using this as an example. So you see, they have 54,150 images, right? So, and then they augment that 
never hear what the opposite is. They don't know what augmentation is. They take the training image and then they maybe rotate it a little bit, or they you know, zoom out a little bit, or zoom in, or you know move it a little bit. Okay, that little mo movement, maybe a couple of pixels to the computer. That's a whole new thing to learn. All right, and so if you augment that and get into about two hundred and sixty thousand with people science Pro, you're looking at three million. Of that, right? So your total training, three point uh, what? Three three mil, three point three three mil. Okay, and over three million of it is synthetic data. Now here they use key points here as well. So key points says are the things you know the skeleton tracking data. Some people totally think there are eighteen of them. Uh, okay. So this is all of the results. I won't. Or all of it, we'll just look at the end results. Training images in your data set. So maybe you're just creating a custom data set of something here. Who knows? Uh, I did one once with uh, Jack Skellington. I don't know if you uh, know. Jack Skellington uh, identified. On your models. And obviously, the more real data you get, the lower it comes in, but there's never any way, any place that hurts your model. No place. Synthetic data improves your model almost every time. A, a little story that I'm going to tell is some of you know Chuck uh, from Saison, right? And, uh, they, they had a client where they did a horse race uh, about two to three years ago. And uh, yeah, so they had a challenge at the uh, where they they couldn't get the they were supposed to identify in real time the numbers on the horses for this software that they were doing. And they couldn't figure it out. So what did Chuck do? He actually created a synthetic data set. This was before anybody knew about this, and he's like, ah, I think this might work. Yeah, not, you know, Chuck, like, oh, man, this might work. You know, let's, let's try. And, do it. and guess what? It worked and delivered for the client. Like this stuff works. All right. So. Let's talk, let's look at a demo here. All right, now, I'm gonna be running Unity on this thing, so it's gonna sound like an airplane's taking off. And let's see if... So we're gonna load this up. It's gonna take a second. I reboot the machine, so the live demo I'm sure it's going to get broken. Okay, there we go. All right, I did not mirror my windows. I don't want to touch that right now because I have to kind of work with that. So here's what we have. Uh, oh, is this template? Or that's the inspector. Okay. So we're going to look at two different scenes. I don't know if anybody has used Unity before. Um, it's just, uh, this is like an ID, their IDE, if you will, it's about how to interact with them. So you have a GUI, and then you can go in and, and edit all your C-sharp scripts underneath the IDE, okay? So we're going to look at two scenes. Right now, this is the first scene. So the first scene that we're going to look at is creating people in just, uh, or excuse me, we're going to be looking at uh, retail, right, in the first scene. We're going to be looking at retail, and we're just looking at a bunch of boxes, all right? So what you have here is a tutorial you can follow along on a tutorial on the Unity website, the Unity Perception website. Go check it out. Uh, they walk through a lot of this stuff in the setup for you, which is really easy uh, to walk through. Uh, Unity is free uh, for the personal edition, so you can play around with it, but you don't have to pay anything. Okay, so you have your main camera here. Now you have to add something called a perception camera, and this is what is picking up all the images that you're going to be working with. Okay, that's this thing here that you add to your main camera. And here you have your labelers. Now, labelers are how you want the output to come for your images. So here I want bounding boxes. 
I want semantic segmentation, which is those colored boxes around a person, right? So it makes it perfectly match there. I want to count of how many objects are in there. And I just want to label it. I didn't do key points in this one. Okay, so I just want kind of the bounding box and the segmentation. And I'll tell me where uh, the latest generated data set is, and we'll come back to that. Because it's 3D, of course, we need a light. Now, simulation scenario. So this is like, think of it, if you're a coder, think of this as a controller in the 3D world. Like this is like your interface where you tell the system, I want all these variations to happen and kind of do all this information for me. And so for this particular one, we have a background object, which is going to rotate among all these different items. It's going to be like a bunch of 3D stuff in the back. But remember when we looked at the background before, we had, you know, random stuff in the back. Uh, seats or, you know, just uh, a river of all nice things. Well, that's what we got to create here. So we just create a bunch of images. We dump them in there. Okay. Uh, we want random textures on there. So as in, by random textures, like mostly avocado and kiwi. Okay. You know, there's a bunch of other stuff you can use too, but you can throw anything in there. It doesn't matter. We also want to change the color and we just give it a good range. Now the foreground is our item that we want to dump on the foreground to have labeled. Okay. And we have these labeled uh, already. Uh, so they're all set up there, and then we want to rotate them random on top of the foreground. And then we just create our gain object, uh, which is getting referenced. So you can look more in the tutorial about all that stuff if you want. And you may be like, okay, so what does this look like? Well, it's going to train pretty fast. So let's train it here and see what we get. Okay, I'll train. Okay. So let's look at, we go to our main camera. Oh, where it is? Well, let me show the folder. Okay, so it's under here for solo. All right, and here's all the sequences. So let's take a look at sequence, is there a 42? All right, so here's what we had at 42. So that's the image that got produced. You can see all this weird stuff in the background. Okay, here it is, the segmentation map that goes on top of that. So that's what the actual items in the bounding box, the bounding box is wrapped around, is this here. Okay, and let's look at the frame data. Okay, so that's the VS code. And here we go. So this is in a format that Unity created called Solo. Okay, you might have heard of YOLO, right? Well, this is Solo. So oh, there's also Coco, right? And so Coco format is the format that's generally used in AI. But this is using something called Solo, because Lord knows why could they use standard, okay? So you can run this through a converter to get it to where you need to, but essentially you get your bounding boxes here. They're very similar to Coco, where you have a center point your center point of your object, and then you have a dimension, a width and a height. So your bounding boxes are the center point of that item and then a width of the height and height in the center. And that creates your bounding box. And that's what this does here. So if you were to you even pull it in straight from here, I was too lazy, sorry, to, to actually create the Python script to you know make this look like a pretty bounding box and stuff. But you can get the idea. Like you could easily look through these and find your scripts. Okay? So that is the uh, first one we want to look at. All right, so that's the first one. Okay, this one was the one where I had a little bit of fun. So I mean, I had a nice little avatar here, and we very similar. Okay, so on this one, I left all these on here, but they're not active. I just want the key point labeler. Like, I just want to create an avatar, a human being with a bunch of key points. Because I want to train skeleton training. You know, maybe I'm doing yoga. I'm training it to identify yoga poses. Or, you know, for you know things that we're doing, we are identifying um, fall detection, right? That's what our grants do. So, like, you know, we're, we're focusing on those kind of things. But anything. anything you can do a sports thing. 
Like, you know, when people are lifting weights, they're using something like this, okay? So, uh, and then we have our nitro perks in here. Let's take a look at her. Oops, All right. Let's see. Okay. So that's what we have here. Um, let's see. For our particular scenario, all I'm doing is an animation randomizer. So, who here's done three D work? Okay. I've done two people. All right. So we got a, not not many. Okay. So when you create a three D model you're going to do what's known as a, a small animation of that, right? And so it's going to be a keyframe sequence of maybe 50 frames, right, of, of a person walking. So this is how they make video games, right? So you're going to say, uh, walking, you know, and you just get a picture of a person doing this. I can't even walk on that. Like, it's just a small little thing of them walking, right? And then you repeat it over and over. And what the system does, the computer says, hey, loop this person walking, this animation style, just loop that until we hit this next, next uh, milestone or next waypoint, okay? And so um, that you have those animations. And this person has a couple of animations tied into her. She was a prefab, which is a prefabricated thing provided by Unity. You can go to all kinds of places and get all kinds of fun models, uh, which your imagination is running wild. This is one. Uh, we created a player, and we have a scale-up on the player. Now, for this one, Unity did not have uh, nodes in right here. So you can see that I had to add those on there. Right, so we have all those skeleton nodes. And then what we do is we just uh, animate this. We just tell it to animate uh, those two nodes. So my character. Got a test animation controller. Uh, right. So I'm going to have it, uh, I labeled some timestamps here, uh, particular items. So you can break your animation down even more. Okay, so we got 150 frames, and then we'll do 20. I think I got walking, picking things up. Just kind of over there. Mm -hmm. You see the key points? They're on there. Everyone's being recorded. I know, you can take it out. <laughs> Punching those numbers. All right, so let's go back to our main camera. And let's see what we got here. Number one. Okay, so obviously we got a lot here. Uh, let's just look at the, let's do the next time. Okay. So you can see, let's look at this uh, figure in image. She's in this, okay? And then let's look at the video. Okay, so you're going to get a little bit different here with the key points. So you have this uh, definition file which defines these key points. So think of it like an enum, right, that you can look up. You can just say, ah, I just need to look up these data points, right? That's what the definition file is. That way, when you're looking at, uh, let's say, label I, or say, uh, index, uh, like index zero, I think it's nose, like index one, et cetera. And then it'll tell you uh, the location, X and Y of that. In the, uh, where the camera sees it. And it also gives it to you in global space. And then um, you can just, because of where all these points are, these are all the key points. If I hadn't been so lazy and created a Python script, this would overlay the key points directly on the model. Okay? And you can use that. So you can see the benefits of, uh, I forgot to tell you the state. So there's uh, three states either it exists, it doesn't exist, or it's occluded, right? That, ah, you get occlusion in a 3D world. Occlusion is, you know, when something's you know, hidden behind you, right? You can't see my hand. And this is one of the big things in the, 
one of the difficulties of the practice of the exclusion is uh, one of the things that you, as a human being, figure out when you're generally between the ages of one and two because you play peekaboo. And that's what the peekaboo is about. Is about for that moment. It means that you can know that something will exist even though you can't see. Okay, so these, that's what exclusion is about. But anyway, that's uh, here. So notice how fast I train my brain. Yeah, it sounded like an airplane. Yeah, it took a little bit of time. <laughs> but how fast could I get going? Three million items. Half a day? A day? That gives me a major competitive advantage with is scraping this data off the internet. Now, we're not quite there where you can keep one on one, but we're almost there. Maybe another year or two, any one of you here could create a data set of whatever you want to use in AI, especially when it comes to image generation, the big boys and big girls. All right? So uh, I think that's about it. Uh, I'll open it up to questions uh, from there. Yeah. Okay, so for like people, it's a good one. Yeah, so one of the things that we are really focused on is representation in our data. So you can customize the uh, people sans, uh, which is the Unity um, setup, for it has all kinds of different kinds of shapes of people, like different shapes, different. Um, uh, I mean, they don't cover all the genders, but they have the major genders there. They have uh, uh, race and ethnicity. They have a lot of them there. And so they introduce all those things into your data set for you. It's just a, because it's 3D, you can just introduce them so fast and it can, be, it can make it completely randomized and balanced as far as the synthetic data set. So uh, I think the 3D is really going to help with those kind of biases. Now, I won't eliminate all of them, but certainly for image generation, yeah, we get rid of a lot of them. Yeah. 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 So that definitely plays a part. So what we're looking at is when we train our data sets, we use a specific um, field of view of the camera that we know we're deploying in production to train the synthetic data or to build these synthetic data sets. Now the elevation is a little tough. Right, so you know you will get some random perspectives, but unless you're like really far off, it's not going to matter too much uh, with just the people who touch it. Yeah. Well, this isn't a promotion of my company, so I want to stay away from that, right? So uh, uh, what this particular aspect, what this solves for us, okay. Is this solves? I think it's very fun to say your company does. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so um, we're working specifically on three things, which are fault detection, mobility detection, and telehealth. And we are using uh, one of the AI systems that we developed that is using this kind of data to have very high recall for sitting at the same time within a home. So we're focused on responding to these kinds of events and helping people live in the home. I mean, that's what we do. Um, and so uh, we're focused specifically on Alzheimer's and autism. So, yeah. This solves a lot of the data generation. We were just looking at, okay, well, what do we do? Uh, I gotta get all this data. Uh, maybe I get a vote taxi. Okay, like they're, they're pretty, they're not bad, two to three grand. I mean, okay, it's, it's a toy. But, you know, it's not super, super expensive. It's less than a hollow lens or like, you know, some of the VR kits that you have to get. But um, the thing is, is that, because uh, I got to practice falling, right? <laughs> right? So I have this room that I made with a, a nice rubber flooring that I put in, and I just got to like trip and fall down and capture it on camera. And I'm like, oh man, this is going to hurt. You know, I'm going to hurt myself. And you got you to do it multiple times. And so the idea is that if you have a 3D generated environment with a physics engine, maybe we can have that person walk and just stick something in the way of the, that person and then capture that uh, as, as replacing that. And so it could help capture some data that normally would be much more difficult for us to get. So 
Um, and then we're using it for a, a number of other things, like uh, we're doing some special uh, camera systems that we're doing. So they're custom cameras. And so when you build a custom AI network, all you need a customized data set. Now you can pull from things like Coco. Uh, Google has a bunch of stuff, or you know, MediaPipe and all these other places. But at the end of the day, you're often going to have to create your own data set. And this is a great thing for this. Oops, it hurt. Is there any good off-the-shelf camera hardware you can use for stuff like this? I mean, sure, sure, sure. Uh, I mean, there are, you know, so when we made our MVPs, and I made you know, dozens of MVPs, uh, a Raspberry Pi camera, you know, it's, it sounds crazy, but you could, you know, use these, you could use this part of it and train a new network on a Raspberry Pi camera if you didn't need any kind of special, especially this, you know, I'm monitoring the back of my house or, you know, this room in my house and, you know, I don't need a ton of stuff, but, you know, maybe I want to count through like a count person, you know, or this door here, you want to put a Raspberry Pi on and say, how many people come inside this door in the last, you know, day, people count it, you know, that could work. And you could train this very easily to augment your data. Um, so it's nothing too special you can get away with. Depends on what you want to do. Try to speed the cars, maybe? Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> so optical flow. I mean, it might be something special for that. You need some high speed, right? 30 frames per second might not be enough. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me out. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys at the next Tech, tech Lancaster Talks. Cool.